Okay, so a few weeks ago, Moo got on his rant horse, that's what I like to call it, um, to talk about his Subaru Forester and all the things that he didn't like about it. Um, I am partly to blame for that, being that I encouraged and organized for the purchase of uh, his Subaru Forester, which you probably saw in his Forest episode at the end of season three. But today, that's not what I'm talking about. We're not talking about Subarus. We're not talking about Nissans. We're not talking about that. We're talking about little cars. One little car in particular is the Blue Turd, which started its life as a stock Daihatsu Sior, bought it from a wrecking yard. No, bought it from a, a dealer. Might as well have been a wrecking yard. Uh, called Y Walk. Um, it seemed okay, like, you know, panels weren't brilliant, um, engine not brilliant, uh, a little bit smoke, a little bit leaky, but it was the best I could find and the price was right. From there, it took a couple of months before the engine blew and, um, you know, something else had to be done with it. So I've been researching 1.3 litre K3V swaps, which is eventually what we what happened. I uh, found a Daihatsu Syrian GTVI a few months ago and swapped the whole front end. You can see that video um, about the, the doing up the blue turd. So now, the things that make little cars awesome. Anyone who owns a little car already knows this stuff. Anyone who doesn't is probably thinking, why would you waste your time driving around in such a little car? And this is a small car. Like, I can touch the other side of it without even reaching across. There isn't much room to move. There isn't much room to spread out. But there are little sacrifices you make for the fact that you have a car that not only uses, like, no fuel, it's light on everything. It's not just light on petrol. It's light on parts, maintenance, tires. There's not as much, you're not dragging around quite as much weight as you are in a big car, meaning that you're not gonna wear out tires as quickly. Um, you know, you're not, you're not being as rough on, on hubs and CV shafts and all these things. It's just, it's just, the car just has less impact. That's not to say it has less impact on the amount of fun that you can have while driving it if you've got one with the right kind of setup. Now, a good example of this will be anyone in the UK who's watching. You guys have had smaller cars much longer than us. Um, I know that's driven a lot by registration, tax, fuel costs, things like that. Um, so you probably understand. I mean, there's a big market for little hot hatches. We don't really have that as much in Australia um, because for a long time it was just as it was just as inexpensive to run a big car. Fuel's cheap, parts cheap, stuff like that. That's slowly changing. Um, so little cars are kind of coming into their own and you know that because the price of Sears has actually gone up in the last few years since we've been playing with them. We used to be able to get them for between $500 to $1,000. Now you'd be lucky to find one for less than three, three and a half. Um, so that says something about the, uh, the landscape and fuel and everything like that. Um, but specifically some things about this car that make it awesome. Uh, firstly, the size. Uh, it's nimble, you can get it into any parking spot that you'll ever find. I'm sure it's not going to go score highly in crash tests, but the other thing is, I think that comes a lot down to how you drive the car, and if you're driving like a crazy person, then I don't think any size car is really going to help you much. So yes, you drive a different way. Ask anyone who's ever owned a motorbike about defensive riding, and a lot of that comes into play in a small car like this too. Um, so what else makes it awesome? Um, okay, so it's nimble, we said it's easy to park. What else? Handling wise, the car is really, really light. That means you don't need a lot of power to have a lot of fun with it. Uh, you know, as you know, it's all about power to weight ratio. So if a car is light, then you don't need as many kilowatts to make it feel fast. And with the one liter that it comes with, doesn't feel fast. Sorry, it's not. 47 kilowatts and I don't know, 100 newton meters of torque or around that number is, is never ever gonna feel fast. With a K3V swap, 1.3 liter, starts to feel fast. It's still not actually quick, really, in the grand scheme of things. I think it's got about 50, 50 to 55 at the front wheels um, on a dyno. Um, that's still not big power, but in a shell that's around 700 kilos from memory, that's a pretty good power to weight ratio, and that means that you can actually, you know, get in and out of traffic and do all those kind of things that makes a car much more enjoyable. So, yes, you can't go and buy them stock, so maybe yours aren't the best example, but there's plenty of other cars around the same size, with the same uh, size engines, Starlets, um, Suzuki Swift, GTIs, a 1.3 litre. So there's many cars out there with similar thing. I know a lot of Honda people are into that for the same reason. If you get one with a decent engine, not the 1.5 carby piece of garbage that we had in our Civic. Um, so which brings me, okay, so that's engines. Um, what, what about drive lines? Well, obviously you're gonna have heaps more fun in a manual small car than you are in something auto. So that's something else to think about. Um, this particular, the GTVI gearbox is actually particularly nice. Um, it's smooth, it's shift, it shifts really easily. The clutch is light, it's a cable clutch, but again, because it's so small, it doesn't take a whole lot of effort to operate. Uh, the original car was a 2002 model, um, and so now the dash is the dash out of an 05 model car. So 
bit of an update there. Um, steering wheel airbag, front uh, drivers and passengers airbag. We also swapped the whole interior, so we've got the GTVI seats, front and rear. Um, the carpet is the Sior carpet with the GTVI floor mats. It's the, it's the um, original door trim, stuff like that. You've got wind-up windows. Normally, not a fan of wind-up windows because you can't reach the other side to wind those up. Not a big deal in this car. You, as I said, you don't even you know you can touch the other side without even leaning over much. Um, so that's not as big a deal as it would be in a big car. Um, power mirrors. That's about it. You do hear aircon. It's not connected in this car, but you do have aircon if you're into that kind of thing. Comfort. I don't know why you would be. So this car's been taken to the track a few times, both in uh, New South Wales and Victoria. Um, it's a thousand kilometre drive down the highway to get to Calder Park to go to Foreign Battle, which was last year. Um, I've done that drive a lot of time in a lot of different cars, fast cars, slow cars, whatever. It was perfectly comfortable. It's a bit noisier. It's not going to have the as good a ride as like a Mercedes or something, which might be the ideal car for that kind of trip. But it made it, and it cost about sixty bucks in petrol, and that is probably the biggest point to talk about. This car in its current form with the 1.3 litre uses half the amount of fuel that my Subarus have. Uh, you know, an average done up Subaru might be hitting around 12 litres per hundred. If you're getting less than that, then you're either lucky or you drive like a Nana. Um, but yeah, this will get six litres per hundred kilometres with the one litre that came in that, that blew, that was actually doing about 6.8. So the 1.3 litre actually uses less fuel and that has a bit to do with the fact that it's pulling around a much lighter car than it was intended for and the engine actually was designed and built as an economy engine. Um, it was actually built uh, with Toyota, so it's a Daihatsu car, um, but the engines are very similar to ones found in Toyota Echoes and overseas they mix and match and do all that kind of stuff. So six litres per hundred, um, 80 kilowatts at the flywheel factory, which ends up equaling about 50 to 60 at the front wheels. Uh, no LSD, so no limited slip diff in the front, but that's that's easily fixed. It's around $500 to stick a different center in it, um, which gives you plenty of grip. In the dry, it's not really an issue. In the dry, around a sharp corner, you're going to be spinning the inside wheels. Um, in the wet, let's not talk about the wet. And probably the next most important thing to talk about is modifying. You can add turbos, you can do exhaust, free up intakes, change the tune, do all those kind of things. Um, with an engine like this that's designed for low emissions, uh, there's sometimes a limit to how far you can push them because they are literally designed to put out as minimal amount of pollution. Um, so a 1.3 that is probably capable of a bit more power than what this comes with. You can get turbocharged factory engines for these. They come out in the uh, Daihatsu YRV, which we get in Australia, but we don't get them turbocharged. In Japan, you can get a YRV turbo. Now they come auto only, um, the Tiptronic Auto. Uh, they never came in manual because the manual gearbox can't handle that amount of power that they're putting out, which to me says good things. Um, as far as getting front cuts for those, that's something that we are going to look to do, hopefully, to uh, a Sior, or this one or another one. Um, but there's a lot of competition from the guys in Malaysia, so anyone in Malaysia who's watching this who has a K3 VET, the price of the cuts is expensive because of you guys, there's just a huge demand. We've been over to Japan a number of times with the show, uh, firstly to go and buy an S15, then we did our Turbos and Temples film, we've been to Auto Salon, we've been a couple of times. One thing we've noticed every single time that we've gone, is key cars. Now, you probably already realize that we're a fan of these things and we're a fan of the setup and the way that that happens in Japan where the registration and taxes are less on small cars. There doesn't seem to be a real reason to not do it here. A lot of people will say, well, they don't pass the same safety tests, um, you've got bigger roads, faster roads. Well, anyone who's been there and it's particularly who's driven there would see that they have 10 times as many highways as we do that are all 110 zones, the same as Australia. And people will sit on there in their key cars all day long. Um, we don't have a market for it. Maybe that would take away from the market that we have. There's probably a bunch of political reasons that they don't do it, but it is a JDM car. Um, yeah, it's, it's, you buy it locally, whatever, but it's fully imported. You can stick a JDM sticker on it and go, I'm awesome if that's your thing. Um, but what you can't do is you can't stance it easily. Uh, people who are into sticking heaps of camber on the wheels and um, parking it in a car park and staring at it all day, uh, uh, yeah, it's not actually that easy to do that and there's a reason for that. It's because it's got a solid beam rear axle, you actually have zero camber adjustment on the back. T to put camber adjustment in the back, you have to cut your, your rear axle and re-weld it. There's a whole bunch of safety reasons why that's not usually the done thing and there's a whole bunch of reasons why it's illegal. Whether it's possible to get engineered, I don't know. If you think it is for some reason, comment and let us know. Um, seen it done, not sure what it does for handling in a car that's this small. 
Um, but yeah, as I said, you actually have to cut and shut your rear axles to get any camber. The front's a different story. You can get you can get coilovers, you can put camber pins in, you can do all that kind of stuff. Interestingly enough, when we did the swap in this car, the GTVI uh, front K frame is actually wider than the Sior, meaning that we got a whole bunch of extra camber on the front, which we weren't really chasing, but actually turns out it doesn't do bad things for the handling. You end up with about two to three degrees. It's gonna wear the inside edge of the tires a bit more, but it actually just, it makes the car um, feel a lot more engaging to drive and as we proved on the track when we've been a few times it just grips it grips handling wise it doesn't grip when you try and put power down and that's something that can be solved as i said with an lsd until you own one and and drive it daily and kind of get used to it you'll never really understand that kind of grin that you get from knowing that you're burning stuff or fuel you're making minimal impact on the environment you're still going as quick as you need to go you can still have a great engaging drive without having to have a big car. And as someone who owns a whole bunch of different cars and has owned a whole bunch of different cars, I can say that cars like this are the ones that you will regret selling because they're just so, there's just something about them. It's just the combination of all these things that make it stick, that you just, it's really hard to get rid of. It's really hard to go to go to something else. It's the reason I can't just own one thirsty expensive turbo car. I can't stand sitting in traffic in something like that knowing I'm just burning fuel for no, no good reason. You've got all this potential power and you can't use it. In a car like this, well, you're burning the minimal amount that's possible in the fact that you're stuck in traffic, you can't do anything about that. Maybe you're not in your heated leather seats, but do you really need them? That's the question. Uh, if you want to go fast, you can make them fast. You can make them fast without introducing unreliability because, again, you're only dragging around 700 kilos worth of weight. So, you know, to, to 100 kilos at the front wheels in a car like this is like having 200 at the wheels in, in a Skyline or a, or a Silvia, which is considered quick, which is what you need to, to have a car that's considered quick. So it's no secret that I'm a fan of these small cars. It's no secret that Mighty Mods started with a car like this and can we continue to use them wherever we can, continue to own them, to drive them. So small cars, maybe not as much to rant about as if I had a Subaru Forester that cost 30 something grand. The total spend on this car is only around $3,000 including servicing it, including all the parts to make it do. Um, there's, really just, there's really just nothing to complain about.